flawless experts who have all the answers? <laughs> That's not this podcast. Instead, we chat with professionals who love what they do, have wisdom to share, and can laugh at their own mistakes. I'm Mark, and I'm the host of the Workplace Solutions Podcast. So let's laugh, learn, and discover the joy of work. Boo, boo, boo. All right, Dan, how you doing today? Man, I am feeling great today, Mark. I'm really excited to talk to you. I feel like you and I have a little bit of kinship around work doesn't have to suck and really excited to engage with you today in this podcast. Preach it, brother. All right. <laughs> so I am here today with Dan Miller, who's the president and chief consultant of Fifth Pillar Consulting. He is an experiential education and leadership development uh, <laughs> shenanigans. I copied this off of LinkedIn. And so uh-huh. <laughs> we'll have to ask uh, what that means. Uh, but I just, I love that. So we're going to be talking today about musical facilitation methods. One of the things I love about Dan and how he approaches experiential learning is his ability to just incorporate music. And just even into times you're just like, oh, he's just walking around with a ukulele. Uh, so hopefully we'll hear some of that later. But But we'll be looking at questions like, why does music make experiences better? How to incorporate music into experiential learning events, the human orchestra, and other methods that Fifth Pillar Consulting uses to uh, use music with their clients. Go ahead and introduce yourself. (laughs) Sure. Well, you did did a good job getting started. I'll I'll play on your your LinkedIn research and say that, yeah, I do, I do leadership development. I do team building. I do musical facilitation. There is another side of my business that is also risk management consulting for outdoor education programs. As that's kind of where I grew up and where I got my facilitator chops. And I, I like to keep that, that sword sharp, if you will. And the, the shenanigans piece is actually a recent addition to my, my LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know what you call that piece, my little blurb. Because, you know, to me, shenanigans just means like, let's, let's drop the facade and just have some fun and be real and be authentic. And I I do think that music can can really help with that, of just kind of setting people free. I think one of the best things that I do for for individuals is to give them a space to be authentic, to be honest and to be themselves. Awesome. All right. So we'll we'll dive deep into that in a little bit. Uh, before we do, we'll do uh, some reminders and then our warm up questions. So reminders, this is the end of the new season, which feels weird because we haven't at time of recording, we haven't released any of these episodes, but Dan is the fifth interview in a series of five. 10 episodes is our new season. So after part two of this episode, we'll be taking another podcast break and then re-strategizing uh, what's next for the podcast. Number two, we revamped the Workplay website, so WorkplaySolutions.com, to make it more clear. So as I mentioned on the episode with John Losey, we create team events and make workshops fun is our clear message for 2023 because our focus is on clarity. And we've got some new workshops and some new team events on the website. So Dan, I love warm-up questions, sure. icebreakers, whatever you call them. I, icebreaker is still like a, trying to find a word to replace it. But since you are a facilitator, I'm going to let you pick the icebreaker question. So tell me or ask me an icebreaker question and then we'll both answer it. Uh, no problem. My, my current favorite is when was the last time you did something for the first time? Man, I love that question so much. I could say I started a business, but I've never done that before. I'm going to go with uh, recently, maybe about nine or 10 months ago, I started writing. Uh, on a website called Medium and have my workplay blog there, but also do humor and satire writing. So I had never written before. So I'd say not that long ago, I started writing and putting humor and satire and reflective stories on the internet. So um, that, that is, that is new. It feels weird because everyone on there is a writer and I don't feel like I'm a writer. So <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just a guy who's, who's creative and sometimes uses words. So, um, <laughs> all right. What about, what about you, Dan? When is the last time you did something for the first time? Well, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk about a, a recent workshop that I did called rhythm and harmony that you were, you were around for that. So I'm going to skip that one. Cause we're going to talk about that more later. And I'll say that 
Just recently, I became certified to deliver the EQI, Emotional mm. Assessment, uh, Emotional Intelligence Assessment. And, and part of that certification is actually engaging with some coaching with a coach around emotional intelligence. So I took the assessment for the first time. I've been working with emotional intelligence for quite a while, but I had never seen it just broken down in a very mm. specific kind of way. So I was coached by someone and looking at my results, I, I've never had that experience before and it was profound. And I'll actually tell you what specifically was profound about it. One of the competencies in the EQI is impulse control. <laughs> and it is it is where I scored the lowest. It was it was very much an outlier in my results, which was not a surprise to me. But the person that was working with me asked me, like, let's talk more about that. And I was like, yeah, I think it, you know, it, it comes from a place of not doing well with boredom. I don't I don't I don't like boredom. And she's like, OK, so we're talking about emotional intelligence. What is the emotion that is underneath boredom? And I had to think about that. I was like, oh, that's a good question. And we landed on that underneath boredom is uh, it's kind of right on the cusp between anger and fear, hmm. which got me thinking about stuff. Like, why, why do I kind of rally against the idea of being bored? And it's because I, I get frustrated and angry when I'm not allowed to be playful or if I don't feel like I had space for being playful in my life. And I had never verbalized that before. I had never put it into that context before. So yeah, my first coaching session around emotional intelligence happened just last week. And uh, it was profound. Got me thinking about things in a different way. Love that. So I think self-awareness is a superpower. We did an excellent conversation with Dr. Chris Auger on what is self-awareness. And that was actually our most popular episode of last year. So go back and check that out if you are interested in diving deep on that topic. So yeah, we're talking about musical facilitation methods. And you know, Dan, feel free to tell stories, to jump into this however you want to. But Actually, I don't know why I'm talking about the topic. I didn't let you say, you know, what do you do and how did you get there? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I, 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 I know what I'm doing at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, you know, you can tell I'm in a room right now that has a lot of musical instruments in it. This is my office slash bedroom slash studio slash entertainment center, you name it. And it's been a long run. I, I used to just bang on stuff when I was a kid all the time. I just wanted to make everything into a drum. And, uh, and so I felt, you know, that there is, there is rhythm for sure inside of me. And it was always trying to get out. I actually, I really wanted to become a drummer. Surprisingly, that's kind of like the one instrument, uh, an actual drum kit that I haven't spent too much time with. Uh, and that may be because when I was like eight or nine years old, I told my dad, I wanted a drum set. And he was like, okay, you can have a drum set, but first you have to get involved with school band and you have to stay in it for a whole year. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I got involved with school band and they gave me a little drum pad and that was it. And then they had me trying to practice different rhythms and mm -hmm. I found that super boring. Um, <laughs> and I, and I didn't make it. I didn't, I didn't stick with it for a whole year. I never got my drum set, Mark. Uh, oh. But uh, that didn't that didn't stop me from just having this music inside of me that wanted to get out. I remember when I was in fifth grade and my teacher would assign some kind of essay or writing assignment. I would walk up to her after class and I'd say, hey, can can I do a rap instead? And uh, thankfully, Miss Miss Hall was her name. Wonderful teacher was like, yes, absolutely. You can. Uh, and so everybody else would, you know, turn in their paper or read their essay. And then I would go up on stage and I would be like, well, my name's Dan Miller and I'm here to say I really like reading in a major way. And <laughs> it was it was ridiculous, uh, but it was <laughs> it was me. Right. Then finally, when I was about 13 years old, I was spending the summer at my dad's house in Louisiana. He had to work a lot of the time and there was a guitar in the house that nobody played. And mm. I I started playing it. I took a couple of lessons, 
but mostly taught myself to play guitar and being 13 years old, like that gave me a sense of identity mm. uh, and, a, and a kind of popularity in, in, you know, social environments that I hadn't experienced before. And I really liked it. I'm, I'm an entertainer. I was also involved in drama and theater and, and uh, having an instrument just made such a difference <laughs> in my being able to express myself. The, the other thing about that that time period getting involved in drama was I I was now in a community where it was totally okay to just fly your freak flag as high <laughs> as you possibly could. And everybody was accepting and even encouraging of that. And mm. so that was really important for me kind of figuring out who I am and what mm. I'm about. And then and then finally I I took that that skill when I eventually started working in outdoor education, I would mostly do canoeing trips at first. And I would carry like a Toys R Us $25, like if you're a six-year-old who wants to learn how to play kind of guitar with me <laughs> on course. And I would use it. <laughs> I would use it for just fun. I would use it for behavior management. I would I would <laughs> have students, you know, complete behavior contracts and their positive consequence was getting to do a guitar lesson with me when everybody else was going to bed. I would use it to like, hey, if everybody's cool during tent time and you actually stop talking when you're supposed to stop talking and go to bed, I'll play you a lullaby. And if you fight me about like, it's quiet time, then you get no lullaby. And, <laughs> you know, bedtime, working with like at risk and adjudicated youth, bedtime became a lot easier to manage. So I just found it as, as a tool that not only helped me as a stress reliever and a way to just get stuff out, but also it helped other people find a little bit of an anchor to help them settle down and work well with others. You know, thinking of those, those trips with the adjudicated youth, the kids who really responded to, to the lullabies. Yeah. Yeah. One of the <laughs> biggest and best things that I learned during that, that portion of my life was that even, you know, the most hardened individuals who would, who would claim that a big part of their personality was that they're tough and they're not into fun and games and they're not into laughter. Like if it's three o'clock in the morning and we're in the middle of a night paddle and we're making up, you know, weird languages and we are freestyling <laughs> different songs, it will bring out the kid. It will bring out the, you know, the trueness of what I think is like inside each of us is that we often, we just want to play and have mm. fun. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm, just speaking for myself. Uh, but I found that in a lot of others is that music helped release that like, oh, okay, it's okay to have fun. Mm. It's okay to not take ourselves so seriously. And that was actually a really powerful and profound piece of the the education that we delivered. I love that. So, you know, I think for, for me, I, I don't know that I would have ever made that connection of music equals play and fun. I own a bass guitar uh, I am not a bass guitarist. <laughs> we'll just say that. So I have one. Uh, I played for a couple of years in grad school where a friend of mine convinced me to join the band for our college ministry, but it was just, <laughs> I'm terrible. So like I got, I feel the, the, that, that is not my happy place or my, you know, where, where I feel comfortable and relaxed. So, you know, what are, I'm, I'm curious, how do you approach folks who are hesitant or, or, you know, getting, um, you know, I'm, I'm jumping ahead in our agenda a little bit, but, you know, how do you deal with folks who say like, I don't have a musical bone in my body or, you know, that <laughs> kind of, that kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah. Resistance definitely comes up in, in work with music and, I think, you know, what I would say to somebody who really counters whatever I'm doing with, sorry, that's not me. I don't have that. I'll, I'll probably say something along the lines of prove it. And as, as somewhat of a challenge, but also, you know, an invitation. But like, it's, you know, it's fine if you don't have a musical bone in your body. Is that going to keep you from trying? Just hmm. like, you know, it's fine if you feel like you don't have a leadership bone in your body. But is that going to keep you from trying? It's fine if I don't have a lot of impulse control in my body, but it's not going to keep me from trying. And, and I feel like there's a lot of metaphor there. One thing that I'll often do, and this, this was a really interesting revelation to me. If I just get up in front of a group and I'm like, okay, everybody, we're going to sing now. 
it does not go well. <laughs> people, people have some real fear about uh, using their voice as an instrument. I had a conversation with somebody the other day about this, of that it's it's a little bit more vulnerable if, if the instrument is not separate from you, but it is a part of you. So a way that I've found to combat that is that uh, if I'm facilitating a game of Simon Says, which I love to do and inspired by uh, Michelle Cummings and Scott Gerst and their amazing uh, twist on Simon Says is, well, okay, well, let's just start out with a game of Simon Says and we'll play that game. And then a few rounds into it, Simon starts saying, harmonize with this note. Hmm. Do. And because we're playing Simon Says, everybody feels like they have to do it. <laughs> it is a really fascinating little thing. So I will get more participation from bringing music in uh, paired with an activity that for some reason people, hey, if Simon says, then it like, I just don't have a choice. Simon said, I have to do it. And once people see that like, oh, actually I, I can do this, even if it's not perfect, that usually opens up the door to the next thing and the next thing. And so for, love that, uh, for folks that aren't familiar with that kind of version of Simon Says, can you give a quick blurb of how that works? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you didn't play that game in you know school when you were a kid, uh, the rules are basically, if I'm going to give you a command or in, in this other version, I'm going to give you a command or potentially ask a question. If that command or question is preceded with the word Simon Says, then please respond. Please do it. If if it's not preceded by the word Simon says, then you should just do nothing. And the the caveat, the big difference with how we play it is that if you if you make a mistake and you respond when Simon didn't say or you do the wrong thing, there's no getting out. And that's a really important piece. When I played this as a kid, I didn't like the game at all because if you messed up, you got out mm -hmm. and, and you played until there was only one person left. That felt really exclusive to me. And so in this version, if you mess up, you just, in your own head, you give yourself a point. There's no consequences to having more or less points. So you just keep playing. And then often you can, you know, you can take that to really interesting places about how you respond to making mistakes. And you'll see the range of emotions from joy and laughter to anger and rage quitting and embarrassment <laughs> and everything in between. And you know, I think especially in terms of working with emotional intelligence, that that ends up giving us a lot to work with and a lot to explore. But that's yeah, that's how the game works. And then, hey, put your right hand up. Oh, no, don't put your right hand up. Simon didn't say, OK, Simon says put your right hand up. OK, put your right hand down and so on and so forth. If you've never experienced this version of it, I think our talking about it doesn't do justice to just how engaging the activity is. And for those of you who are facilitators, trainers, teachers, educators, those kind of things, make sure you hear what Dan said about folks, activities where folks are isolated and kicked out for not performing. So those aren't inherently wrong, but if you're doing that a lot, that, yeah, that, that can really change your day. So, so I love that that's an activity where you can say, Hey, you can keep playing even when you make mistakes, because uh, that's really what we want folks to do in the real world <laughs> is, yeah. is not get, not give up after they've, they've made their first mistake. So, so Dan, let's talk about some of these activities or methods that you do. So why don't you pick one and tell us about it? Sure. You know, in my, in my recent workshop, one of the things that I experimented with and was really happy with the outcome is one of the first things that we did in kind of getting into rhythm was I, I played the song from Queen, We Will Rock You. We will, and there's a, there's a rhythm that goes with that that is just stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, mm -hmm. stomp, clap. And that rhythm is the same. It's very repetitive. It keeps going. The song is about two and a half, three minutes long. It ends with a rock and guitar solo. Uh, and so I asked my participants, hey, for this whole time period that this song is on, I just want you to focus on stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. And it's kind of a long time. And what I asked them to pay attention to is if there is a moment in those two or three minutes where they move from being in their heads and thinking about the rhythm. Oh, like mm. I got to keep the rhythm. 
I got to get it right, like to move from that brain space into your body. And if you're going to be working with music and rhythm, and if you're going to be working with emotional intelligence and self-awareness, uh, it's really helpful to pay attention to what's going on inside your body. And I had several individuals when I asked at the end, so did anybody feel the shift from like thinking about this and trying to do it right to just being this rhythm and mm. not really worrying so much about if it's perfect? And there is a handful of people that were just like, yes, mm. I experienced that. And I was I was like, great. Now hold on to that as we continue <laughs> to engage with, you know, we'll step it up a little bit with some different exercises. I do a lot of call and response. If if folks have worked with me, they they know one of my favorite books is Dr. Seuss's Fox and Socks. And <laughs> so you get a big audience together, you get a bit a little bit of rhythm going. And then you're like, okay, so when I say this, you just you just repeat it back to me. You're my echo. Fox and socks, fox and socks, knocks in box. And Starts out pretty easy. Then we get into Tweedle Beetles. You know, when Tweedle Beetles fight, it's called a Tweedle Beetle battle. When they battle with a paddle, it's a Tweedle Beetle paddle battle. Uh, <laughs> that becomes a little more complicated. And I, and there's a lot of mistakes that are made. And again, it's it's I really like to open up that space to explore what do you do when when you make a mistake? What do you do when you're given a challenge that you really should not be expected to meet at an A plus 100% kind of level? And what are the consequences of messing this up right now? Like, let's look at our context. And it it continues to open people up a little bit to like, all right, I guess we're just playing and having fun. And there is no real consequence to messing up. And once you've set that stage, and there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with rhythms and, and partners and being on tempo with people, even in the virtual space, it's kind of fascinating. But then when you start getting into harmony, which mm. is what people really seem to be averse to and afraid of, of, mm. okay, I'm being asked to use my voice. I'm being asked to hit the right note. And if I don't hit the right note, it's obvious. The larger the group you're in, the less obvious it is, which is nice. Then that's, you know, exploring some real vulnerability. And what generally happens, especially when you're doing that as part of a large group, it's easier to hit the right note because you can feel it. It's not just mm. what you hear, it's it's what you feel. And when you are in sync and when you're in harmony with a group of people, there's a feeling that is really hard to, to replicate outside of, of musical facilitation. So then we start getting into a little bit of, of, yeah, so this is how harmony works. You know, you got the one, you got the three, you got the five. We're going to have this group over here. They're going to hit this note, do. And then this group over here, this is your note, do. And now let's practice that. Let's try to do it together. Let's see what that sounds like. And eventually we have a bunch of small groups that are owning different notes. And this is my favorite part. This is kind of what the human orchestra gets into is as a musician, I get to play the audience as though they were another instrument. And this was inspired by Bobby McFerrin doing some really amazing work with large audiences. He turns them into an instrument. Jacob Collier is kind of an up and coming musical phenomenon. And if you've watched videos on Jacob Collier conducting the human orchestra, it is amazing and inspiring and beautiful. And I want to mm. create that experience for people. And I find music is one of the most authentic ways for me to do it. And it's also just a shortcut. Like it can take us there in a pretty short period of time of, what does it really feel like to be in perfect harmony with a group of individuals? Now let's explore that metaphor outside of music because harmony shows up in a lot of ways in an organization or in a team. It's interesting. You know, you've mentioned kind of very large group experiences. Does this work on a smaller scale? Because I can see the, for the folks that are anxious or nervous, that idea of like, oh, all right, there's, you know, there's 60 or a hundred people in this room. It's a little emotionally safe is the wrong word, but it feels, it feels safer. Do you find some of these techniques still work with smaller groups of people? The rhythm techniques? Yes. Okay. The rhythm is a lot more accessible. We all have a heartbeat and, you know, in, in, most of us have experienced at least like, maybe we're not dancers, but maybe we'll at least tap our foot when mm -hmm. we hear a catchy tune. Not everybody, but Many, many people have at least had some exposure to working with rhythm and feeling rhythm. So I've, if I have a smaller group, I'm probably going to 
not dive as deep into harmony unless I have a group of of singers who love that mm-hmm. stuff. But I'll I'll use rhythm, and I can I mean you can do rhythm work with one or two people, and it's, it's still pretty awesome. Okay. At the AEE conference, you had a very special event. The I, I titled it "Funky Conference Thingy" because I don't remember exactly what you called it. So, what tell us about what that was and that experience? And um, and, and AEE because I we always define acronyms is the Association for Experiential Education. Yeah, love that that organization. Worked there for a long time. I've sponsored every conference since I started my business. And this last one, as as kind of a part of my sponsorship, I said, hey, I'll, I'll help out with this stuff. I'll give you all some money. But what I want is Saturday night. And we called it the AEE Techno Folk Extravaganza, which is kind of a, a harkens back to when I, I used to kind of split my time between being an outdoor instructor and being a professional musician. And I'd set up little tours for myself. And what I realized is as a as a solo act, and someone who was pretty nomadic for a long portion of my life back then. I didn't have a band. I, I didn't stay in any one place long enough to put together a band. I started getting into an artist named Keller Williams, who is a looper. And there's a lot of loopers out there now. It's become more popular. I think Victor Wooten was one of the one of the first ones to really bring it to the main stage. So I've got, you know, back back there behind me, I've got a little machine that if I'm starting to play a little guitar riff. And it's like deedle a ding dunk, ba dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, ba dunk dunk doodle lung. And then I push the magic button, that riff keeps going. And I don't have to do anything anymore. So now I got deedle a ding dunk, ba dunk dunk doodle lung. And then I go over to my bass guitar and I boom, 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 push the magic button. And now I have a bass and a guitar going at the same time. And then I go over to the microphone and I'm just like, all right, this sounds pretty cool. Let's add some some drums. And I'm <laughs> and and now I have like a whole band behind me and and then I can start to jam with myself and I, I honestly I don't always know if the audience is loving it but man am I having a good time when I'm doing that kind of stuff <laughs> I'm just I talked earlier about how important it is for me to be able to play and so mm-hmm. that was a perfect example of just creating a space for me to be able to play, for me to be able to play with my audience a little bit. So I've been developing that. Now I have a drum machine and, and a keyboard and loop pedal. And my loop pedal has all kinds of freaky effects on it. And you can just get weird. And so I've kind of focused on that. Like, let's let's just get weird. Um, we'll see what <laughs> happens. And And I will say that, you know, that particular event at the AEE conference, I don't, I don't think it went especially well. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just be totally honest. We called it the AEE Techno Folk Extravaganza. And I think a lot of people came into the room like, yeah, techno, let's do it. I'm here. I'm ready to oh. dance. <laughs> uh, and once they found out that it was perhaps a little bit more acoustic uh, extravaganza than just techno and maybe even a little more folk, uh, a lot of people left the room. Uh, and <laughs> That's okay. You know, we learn from these experiences, but there were individuals who stayed and those individuals became a part of the show. And that's, you know, that's what I love. I don't want to play a show for you. I want to play a show with you. Mm. I don't, I don't want to do, you know, leadership development and team building for you. I want to do it with you. And so Mm. that's one of the many ways that I think I can draw people in as a facilitator and and Mm. just a weirdo. I'm thinking about so many things from your comment there that, you know, as a facilitator, you know, your own enjoyment is, you know, like the group isn't there for you, but the flip side of that is if you're not having fun, that translates to your ability to facilitate. So if you're not enjoying yourself, if you're not smiling, if you're not like, I enjoy this. So I think of, you know, the times where, I changed up an agenda because I wasn't having fun and it wasn't, I wasn't choosing myself over the group. It was for me to be my best and give them what they need. I need to be enjoying what I'm doing too. And I I think that's, that's self-awareness, but that's also that recognition that that's not, 
inherently selfish. Cause I think there's something in me that wants to resist. It's like, no, I'm, I am completely a, you know, servant hearted leader who is in this event is, is serving the group, but to serve the group well, I need to be making sure that I'm taking care of myself. So. Amen. Yeah. All right. So we've been going for a little bit. So we're going to end part one and then we'll go into part two here in a little bit. My guest today has been Dan Miller, the president and chief consultant of Fifth Pillar Consulting, who is a experiential educator, a leadership development dude, and loves shenanigans and has recently been certified in the EQI. And we'll pick up with part two next week of music facilitation methods. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review, tell a friend, give us a gold star, or call my grandma. And if you want unforgettable events and training that's fun, like for real fun, get started today at WorkplaySolutions.com. I know I want that. (laughs) Boo, boo, boo. Deedle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, deedle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, deedle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, deedle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but dunk dunk doodle lung, beetle a ding dunk, but d